and then the last one will be and then we'll have the last climate based successions on blue economy on june 27th this is a short introduction um these lessons are developed in collaboration with climate launchpad and they are possible thanks to i reshape which is iris government program for over this development so I received the climate Kids have been working together since 2019 in many different climate innovation projects in Africa, Asia Pacific, and Latin America. And since 2020, I received has a climate unit dedicated to climate diplomacy, and they have to focus on green innovation and entrepreneurship in those regions. The climate kick is responsible for many different uh, work across many areas of climate innovation, but in the entrepreneurship sectors, we are uh, a platform which includes climate and climate launch and climate accelerator programs, and we also identify and support and invest in entrepreneurs through every stage of innovation. So today's session is about diversity, equity, and inclusion with Thea Bojo. So I'll give the floor to her to introduce herself, and um, I hope to enjoy this session. Okay. Hello. Um, I just want to ask if Shaima, are you connected? Because on my screen it says um still connecting. So I'm not sure if she's connected. We don't know because he's still connecting. Um, if she might have internet issues, but since yeah, this is going to be recorded and available on YouTube, everyone okay. can access it. We so can, we can send this to the list of, of participants of the district, anyways. Okay, so we can just send it. So it's okay. We can proceed. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. So we can just start. Um, I don't know what happened. So for today, we're we're discussing the climate basics. It's learning sessions on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So wait, Ines, could you go back to the previous one? It's just. Um, a bit more back. Uh, next, please. So this is something like to think about. Um, how do you say diversity, equity, and inclusion in your own language? How do you translate this? If you're talking to someone in your own language, just think about this first. How would you say diversity? How would you word equity? And how would you word inclusion? Um, we all know that a lot of those terms come from, you know, mostly from academics. So probably in your own language, um, there is no exact word for it, but rather just a description of it. So think about that. Um, how would you say it in your language and not using the word itself, diversity, equity, or inclusion? Next, please. The agenda, there's three things that we would be discussing, the significant benefits of diversity, equity, and inclusion and in driving innovation and a success in um, climate-focused startups. The second one is practical steps to create and nurture inclusive environments. And the last one is so the strategies to overcome common challenges in promoting DEI in climate-focused startups. Okay, some not-so-fun facts about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, the world's richest person, we all know who it is, it's Elon Musk. He earns approximately $150 million per day. And if you see the contrast, 700 million people in the world are living on less than $2 a day. So that's the huge inequality in the world right now. And majority of these people living in poverty are women. And, it's, um, and according to the World Economic Forum, at the rate that we're going, it will take approximately 169 years for us to reach economic parity and 162 years for political parity. What does that mean? Parity is sort of a state where, we're, where we have equal rights. So economic parity, it's going to take us 160 years before men and women would have equal pay for equal work. If at the rate that we're going, okay, 162 years for political parity. It means that for women to have the same political power as the men, it's going to take us 162 years at the rate that we're going. So the source of that is the World Economic Forum study. And if you look at LBGT-owned businesses, 
they often struggle to secure venture capital and government contracts compared to their non-LGBTQ counterparts. Um, a lot of uh, VC funding is also mostly available to men. If you look at it, women also have struggled accessing this VC capital um, um, funding, but more so with the LGBT community. 80%, um, if you look at climate change, 80% of those displaced by climate change are women. They are most vulnerable to that. Um, and if you look at the unpaid care work, unpaid care work is anything that you do at home, caring for the children, domestic work at home, those are unpaid care work. You would see that um, on average, women spend four hours per day on unpaid care work and only 1.7 hours per day on men. And this is the global um, average. If you look at those countries that are um, in the poorer countries or the middle income countries, it's so much worse. Women spend 14 times more on unpaid care work than the men. So why are we discussing unpaid care work? This is about equity and inclusion, about climate change, because this uh, the unpaid the amount of time that you spend on unpaid care work actually takes out time for you to do other things, to pursue other things, whether that's economic, whether that's you know uh, further education. So that actually contributes to the burden and gives you less time to pursue other things. So according to the World Bank, uh, the, it, they predict that by 250, climate change could force over 143 million to migrate within their countries and across borders worldwide. So the uh, the refugees and migrations that we're seeing right now is just the tip of the iceberg. It will significantly increase in Europe and across the years. So those are some of the just some not fun facts on, on diversity, equity, inclusion in terms of climate change. So we're, we're using those terms. So but what does it really mean? We're using the word diversity. What does it mean? So diversity refers to the presence of differences within given setting. So it's very broad differences. So it's different. It, it depends on what context you're using it. So differences in the context of workplaces, communities, or social environment. So it encompasses a wide range of attributes and characteristics that makes each individual unique. So this could be race and ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Those three things are different. Um, we could go in, on and on to discuss those things, but those are different things. There's sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Uh, there's also differences in age. There's, there's terms of diversity in age. This includes generational cohorts. Um, diversity in terms of our abilities, whether that's physical, cognitive, and emotional. And there's also diversity in terms of social status, um, in terms of salaries, in terms of education, and in terms of experiences. There's also diversity when you talk about religion, belief systems, or cultural backgrounds. So that's diversity, the presence of those differences in a specific context. So equity, what is equity? Um, Equity, simply put, it's the practice of ensuring fair treatment, access, and opportunity. Okay, so most of the time, you hear the word equity and equality. So it's good to differentiate that. Equality is mostly, in simple terms, it's access to rights. You can have equality, but not equity. So we would say equality, everyone has the same access to rights, but equity Think of it as resources, equal access to resources. So equity is about acknowledging that maybe we all have the same rights, but we are not um, at the same starting point. Some people are given more resources to start with, and some people have less. So equity is making sure that everyone has an equal starting point. So that's equity. And inclusion, what does inclusion mean? So inclusion is about the environment that welcomes the diversity. So the diversity is acknowledgement that there are different groups. Inclusion is making sure that despite that differences, there's a certain environment that these different groups, these different individuals can feel welcomed and respected and supported. So an inclusive climate within an organization, it embraces the differences. It, it also offers certain respect. So it's not enough that you embrace it and to acknowledge it, but also those differences must also be highlighted and used and acknowledged. So there's a certain, how do you say it, like 
promotion of those differences. So that's inclusion. So it's not merely acknowledging, but using those different talents, talents and those different um, passion to elevate that, that is inclusion. Next, please. Okay, so understanding diversity, equity and inclusion and climate change. So why are we discussing those concepts of diversity in terms of climate change? So first is that climate change impacts very vulnerable populations. So we acknowledge that there's already inequality and climate change further aggravates that inequality so that it does not impact everyone equally. And that is something that we have to acknowledge. So there's a disproportionate effect of climate change for different people. So it affects marginalized communities more. So these people who are already experiencing some forms of inequality, that experience is further aggravated by climate change. Most of the time, these groups live in areas that are more susceptible to environmental hazards. So, and apart from that, when they experience the, the negative effects of climate change, they have fewer resources to um, fewer resources to cover to recover from that impact. Um, next is health inequities. So there are disparities in terms of um, people's health and how they can protect them themselves from the effects of climate change. So you can see like in areas where there's um, increasing temperatures, for those who have resources, they can afford air conditioners. Um, for those with less resources, they can't, and therefore they would have a lot more problems. Um, for countries who have um, laws in place in terms of handling pollutions, so there would be uh, fewer health-related, uh, there, there would be few, fewer health issues regarding pollution. Whereas in poorer countries where this is less, uh, less regulated, you would have a lot more health issues. So this inequities in terms of health of people and this affects people. So that's why we need to talk about these things. Another one is inclusive climate action. We cannot have a certain action or certain solution without looking into without looking into the impacts of climate change. Um, we should have equitable policies. This involves inclusive decision-making process and, be, and hearing diverse perspectives in terms of how we do climate solutions. Because anything that is not inclusive in terms of climate solutions, there is no sustainability to it. And another thing is that, like we were talking about, like the effects of climate change is mostly felt by those who are vulnerable and therefore, we need to build community resilience. And building community resilience involves a lot of dialogue and making sure that this is inclusive. And the next one is environmental justice. So when we say environmental or climate justice, we also use the word climate justice. Climate justice is making sure that each one, the rights of each one is protected the right of everyone to have equal access to resources, equal access to clean air, clean water, and all of that aspect is protected. So when we talk about climate justice or environmental justice, there's also a historical context, context to it. We should not forget that there are certain parts of the world that sort of conquered another part of the world and used their resources, and therefore these part of the world is left with fewer resources and thus experiencing the effects of climate change. So we should acknowledge that, that the historical context of climate change, that colonization played a part in using up resources and thus um, using up certain resources in one part of the land, one part of uh, the world, and thus these, this part of the world has now fewer resources to mitigate climate change. So there should be that acknowledgement. Otherwise, it would be difficult for us to have a dialogue. Um, the next one is that what another part of the of climate justice is the acknowledgement of diverse leadership. So effective leadership means that there's different people are involved, different um, voices are heard. So it's not only important that people are participating, different people groups are participating. We should look at the leadership per se on who is leading these campaigns. There should be diverse voices to that. And next is holistic approaches. So um, holistic approaches is very important because climate change is not just a question of science, but actually is this 
it talks about social inequity. Everything, everything about it, you have everything about it is is interconnected. So there should be a holistic approach in terms of climate change solutions, and that is why we need an in-depth understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, here are some of the things you can discuss. Like, where are some areas of work that you see the link between diversity, equity, and inclusion in climate change solutions? Is there certain um, particular areas of your work where you see this nexus? Are there links in your local community or your region or your country? So I'm not sure if any one of you would like to share. You can also share on chat if you want, or you can raise your hand and, and speak. That's also okay. Um, otherwise, you could also just think about it. So what are the significant benefits of DEI in driving innovation and, and success in a climate-focused startup? Um, as Ines has told you at the beginning, primarily Climate Kick is a climate-focused organization, and we're looking also into social entrepreneurship. So we're looking at the context of DEI in terms of innovation within this context of climate-focused startup. So um, one importance of that is that diverse perspectives, like I mentioned, the diversity of perspectives allow for a wider range of ideas and solutions to be considered. So different viewpoints can lead to innovation and approaches that might have not been considered otherwise. And what's also interesting is that there are certain local um, knowledge also that we can gain from this that could help us innovate. Um, one of the things that um, I like was that uh, a few months ago, I was in London and there was a, a uh, what do you call it? Um, in the museum, they were showcasing um, innovations in agriculture, oh, sorry, architecture, innovations in architecture. And they were saying, oh, this is such an innovative way of, of building roofs that we don't need to use a lot of air conditioning or heating. And it was just so hilarious to me because that exact architecture, we have been using that in the Philippines in some remote islands to reduce heat. And I was just thinking that if they had someone in their team who was living in a coastal area, who was living in a Southeast Asia, this is not an innovation. My grandparents have been using that technology for years. So there is that certain gap. If we don't consider diversity, then some of those technology might be lost. So yeah. Next is creativity and innovation. Um, when team members feel valued and respected, regardless of their background, they're more likely to, likely to contribute unique ideas. This is what I'm saying. If you value their experiences, then they would have that confidence to share. My great grandmother's roof is shaped like this, and this is the materials that they use. You know, it could have saved them a lot of money, a lot of um, pounds, and a lot of time if they just have someone in the team. Next is an important thing. Um, because we, uh, some of you might be um, might be engaged in social entrepreneurship. So market insights. Um, someone from your team would have a great understanding of communities and that can inform product development and marketing strategies. This is awesome. I know you would have seen a lot of these commercials and think, why didn't anyone just point it out? You know, like that is such a stupid thing to put in a commercial that is so inappropriate. If only there was someone else in their team who had pointed it out. So this is very important when you're doing market insights, that is very important to make sure that your team is very diverse, not only just like, uh, not for the, not just the, for the philosophy of it, but, but because it makes sense, it makes some um, economic sense to have that. Next, talent, attraction, and retention. So inclusive workplaces are attracted to top, top talent. So most of the time, um, if you have good people, um, talented people, they would like to look into that. So if you want to be at the forefront of your industry and you want to attract the right people, then you have to make sure that you have DEI in place. You have mainstream DEI. Um, risk management and adaptability. So teams with diverse expertise and backgrounds are better to prepare to anticipate risk. It's because you have different insights, people from different backgrounds, people from different experiences, and therefore you have a lot more to put on the table in terms of adapting and in terms of managing, managing the risk. 
And the last one is the corporate reputation and brand loyalty. So consumers and investors, they increasingly value comp companies that demonstrate DEI and sustainability. So this is something to consider. Or if you are raising funds for, through VC or even bilateral um, funds through bilateral organization, this is something that they look into. So some of the, just some facts about DEI. So diverse teams drive innovation and adaptability. So some of some, just some numbers. So companies with diverse workforce are 35% more likely to experience greater financial returns. So there are studies that, that um, support this. Um, it also helps to attract better candidates. So one in three candidates will not apply to a company that does not look diverse. This is very important. Um, for a lot of for a lot of people, they would look at LinkedIn, they would look at the people who are employed by that company in LinkedIn and, and just, you know, based on that, see if they would like to work with you. Um, customers want to see companies that reflect the diversity of their communities. Exactly. Co um, customers would like to see themselves reflected in your product. So if they don't see themselves reflected in your product, then most likely they will not engage you. And another one is that global research found out that 88% of people agree that not enough brands do a good job in representing people that are similar to them or similar to their community. So like I said, customers would want to be reflected in your product. Customers would want to be reflected in your ads or just in general, any communication or materials that you have, they would want to be reflected in that. And another is that different and diverse investments can be attracted can be attracted. So if you have, I don't know, good DEI policies in your organization, then it's easier, easier to raise funds. It opens up more doors. Um, more investors are looking into the diversity of top companies and they're looking at how um, at the diversity of the people you're trying to reach. So yeah. So some reflections. Uh, what are some DEI mainstreaming practices in your organizations that you think works well? So as, um, and I think that a lot of you are on different levels in terms of mainstreaming DEI in your organizations. Maybe some of you are just at the very beginning while some have a more developed policies in place. So I guess it's different starting points. Um, just think about what certain practices in your organization that you think is like sort of this is really working well. This is what we can highlight. And think about all those policies in place also or practices that you need you think needs to improve on. Or maybe you still don't have any practices. Um, then what are those practices that you think should be put in place to mainstream DEI? Um, I see some questions or some comments in the chat, but we can address those after the talk, if that's okay. Unless they are, you want to come them or Ahmed if you want to also speak up we can we can address it now but sorry I, I'm having difficulty seeing the, the chats it's just Ahmed is it's mentioning that they are organizing a book camp in the climate launch in Morocco Hi. a special meeting about women in clean tech Hi. go ahead Hi. how are you yeah. uh, good morning I don't know if you hear me, but um, I, uh, I hope. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it, and uh, yeah, I just uh, I'm I'm just interested uh, because we we're dealing with uh, a different perspective. Once uh, once I tell people that we have to invest in the women in think tech in Morocco, and I say, well, we we don't have that 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 big problem. I think this issue. Uh, is misunderstand uh, misunderstood by a lot of people. Uh, uh, as we know that uh, that there are so many family businesses, uh, especially in Africa, and uh, in Morocco as uh, as one of the countries, uh, is that a lot of business families are driven by uh, driven by women, and uh, and uh, one of the reasons why I launched this. Uh, uh, women in clean tech initiatives in Morocco because I feel that they are, they are, you know, they, there is a big gap between them and technology, and I think if we, if we can use that much more and uh, and invest in that, that uh, we will advance those women in the businesses and uh, and also, you know, get them out of poverty and and get more equal 
opportunities in the clean tech industry, which is one of the largest markets in the world. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to hear more insights about this. I'm, next Thursday, we have an expert meeting about this. Uh, and we even launched a website called womeninkleantech.com. And, uh, and I hope it's going to be a start of, uh, of an, a new wave to stimulate, uh, I mean, not just women, but also leaders uh, investing in STEM, but also to invest in the, in the clean. And clean tech, of course, is, is, is connected to the climate change and, um, you know, and, and everything with, you know, what the global market is asking for. So yeah, uh, that's. I just want to share this with you. I just want to say thank you, for, of course, for for the insights. Uh, I know we have a lot of champions who are women at the moment. I'm really surprised because I'm based in the Netherlands because this this subject is very important from from the Western perspective also. Uh, as I've been working in the diversity and inclusion for many years, but as now I I work in Africa more, I see there is another approach needed. And I would love to, you know, to combine both and uh, to see how we can advance that. Because last three years we had winners from the Morocco climate launchpad, and they were all women. So it's positive from one hand, but it's not enough. So if you get, if you dig deeper, you know, one champion is not enough. You know, we have a football team. It doesn't mean that everybody is playing football. Uh, every girl is playing football. So. Yeah, and it's exactly the same thing with the clean tech. So, uh, yeah, we, I would love to to share this with the clean climate cake family and uh, everybody involved in this, just to uh, to see how we can advance this this issue and also to have more diversity uh, concerning concerning the the regional uh, the regional approach of uh, of uh, of uh, diversity and inclusion uh, in the climate uh, in the climate. Uh, from the climate perspective. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you for sharing that one. Um, in the next few slides, we will talk about like certain steps that we could do to further um, mainstream diversity, equity, inclusion in this organization. And I think that will be useful. But thank you for bringing up that in the clean tech industry, um, there's a lot of it is women-led. But what's interesting is that I know a lot of you are in different kinds of industry. And you can say that this particular industry, a lot of women are in that field. But one of the things that we should also look into is the entirety of the value chain. Let's say, for example, in the particular clean tech, okay, fine, there's a lot of women involved. But what about their suppliers? Are the suppliers mainly controlled by a certain group to the point that these women who are in clean tech do not actually have a seat on the negotiation with their suppliers? Because that is also possible. So we see that a lot of things. We encourage women, okay, okay, uh, be involved with this, be involved with that. But the circularity of it, you, if you look at the whole value chain, there's still some industries where the value chain is broken because you see that there are certain groups, certain minorities who have no seat in the negotiation. A big example of that is the seaweed industry where it's primarily controlled worldwide by women, but these women have no seat in terms of the market value of buying and selling of seaweeds. And that is very important. So that is what I was like, if we talk about inclusion, so that's why as a startup, this is also something that you have to be um, aware of. Like, okay, I have a lot of women in my, in my program and all of that, but do they actually have a say in the buying of the selling? Do they have a say in the market? Do they have a seat in the negotiation? then that's the only way that they are truly empowered, that they are truly involved in the entirety of the value chain. So just something to think about, because I'm not sure in terms of clean tech or in terms of the exact industry that you are you are at. So thank you for, for um, opening it up. Thanks, Ines. Uh, next, please. Okay, what, what, this is what I was saying, what are practical steps to create and nurture inclusive environments in a climate-focused startup? So the first one is some of the things that we could look into is having gender, gender equity in your leadership team will allow for better decisions. So, sorry, I'm having, yeah. So one of the things is that, so having gender equity in your, in your team, so it's it's it allows you to have a more diverse perspective on those, on, on on the industry that you're working at, like what I mentioned. 
Um, in addition, funding for women-led organizations is becoming more popular. Um, even with us, with Climate Kick, we would have certain uh, programs that are targeted towards women-led organizations. So you do also look into the diversity of board members. So not just the leadership, but also the board members. So moving beyond your internal th team and thinking about your board, how many women do you have there? Or how many minorities do you have there? Is the board a reflection of your brand? Do you say that my brand is very diverse? I'm trying to reach, an example of this is that if, if whatever it is, if your product is targeted towards women or targeted to a specific minority, but your board is not a reflection of that one, then you are not very effective in in the brand that you are selling. So your leadership, whatever it is, your leadership and your board should be a reflection of what you believe in and also a reflection of the brand that you are selling. So these actions are not only relevant for gender, but also life experiences, like what I mentioned before in terms of diversity, disabilities, economic background, whether they come from rural or city, things like that. Next, please. An example of, sorry, um, Ines, I'm sorry. I think that I think what you have is an old version. It's the one you sent me. One second, maybe it's not good. Okay. Okay, but we'll proceed. It's okay. Another one is it's hiring processes. Ensure that you're using gender neutral languages in your job posting. So for example, um, yeah, one of the things is that you could always say like, um, this is important because we talked about a while back in terms of, of um, unpaid care work. So one of those things that prevents a lot of women from going back to the workforce is that when you say it's office work, then it's so much difficult for them to juggle, let's say unpaid care work and the job. So opening up your startups to more remote or hybrid opportunities actually opens up to a lot more diverse community. People with disabilities, it would be easier for them to be engaged with their startups if it's a hybrid or they don't have to go to the office, they don't have to commute. Um, it's, also, it's also important to use a binary language instead of just using he, you could use he or she or they. Um, those things. So be be mindful on on how you word it. List the salary on the job advertisement. So I know this is not a common practice for everyone, but so as not to waste people's time, be open and transparent on the salary. Okay. Um, research show that women and other minorities tend to to pitch their salaries lower, so thereby increasing inequity gaps. And one of the practices actually that stood just top is when companies or organization ask people for their previous salary. So we now have a, a gap between men and women. And if you still ask them, what was your previous salary? And you peg their current salary to their previous salary. And therefore that gap will remain. So the only way for us to, to, um, to bridge that gap is to not ask for the previous salary. It should be a common practice that you would not ask for the previous salary. You hire that person based on their capacity right then and now. Like when you interview them, you see, this is your, I feel this is your capacity, this is the pay. So not pegging it on previous salary. So blind TV screening. So it has shown that there are certain biases of individuals in terms of even just the name or the race. I know in some countries like Germany, it's a common practice to include your photo, which I think should also be stopped. Um, it's it's a, it's a, what do you call it? It's just nature to look at people and then to have certain biases in the way they look, biases in their name. So are there, there's a certain, um, there are things that you can use to, to have more blind CV screening. This means that maybe for the, your HR, before they give you the, the CV, they take out the name. So you, you review it based on just the qualifications and no name. It's a candidate one, candidate two, candidate three, and you choose it like that. 
Um, diversify where you advertise jobs. So this is important and also depends on what you're looking for. Maybe not all of them are on LinkedIn. Not all of them are active online. Um, it really depends. There are certain, there are certain, let's say you wanna you want some to to reach out to a lot more people. You should look into other sources of where we post our job. This is very important because where you post our job, essentially, it's just those people that that manage to reach you. So you are just talking to the same crowd. Next. Uh, this one, certain policies to implement equitable parental leave policies. Again, this is this depends per country. For most organizations, they would say they would just stick to the minimum of the countries. They would say the minimum is I don't know six eight weeks or eight weeks, but that doesn't mean that you have to comply with the minimum. I always say that even with climate kick, it is a suggestion. You can always go beyond that, so it's up to you. So 32% of men and 24% of women say they are hesitant to take their full parental leave due to fear of stigma and surrounding it. So does your organization actually breed that kind of, of behavior that people are afraid to take time off because they will be penalized for it? And the number rises for 43% for LGBTQA parents. Why is that? Because in some countries, there are no protection for LGBT, LGBTQA parents. So if they adopt children, they are not entitled to parental leave. So it makes it harder and harder for them to ask for that kind of leave. So in other countries, they don't recognize um, marriage between same sexes. So that means that when their partner is sick, sort of they don't have no legal recourse to ask for anyone and say, you know, I need to take a leave, I need to take care of my partner. Because what if they don't have that um, rights so how to make policy inclusive, offer flexible working policies, provide parental leave of the employers, not just long-term staff, and also lead by example. As a leader, you have to lead by example. There are other small things too, like if you have women who are breastfeeding, okay, maybe some corners where they can do, where they can pump, okay? What is your breastfeeding policy? Can they just pump? Can just, this is some of the things that I find ridiculous. Like even in Belgium, we have protection for women, breastfeeding women, but they give time. They would say like, oh, 15% before lunch and I'm sorry, 15 minutes before lunch and 15 minutes after lunch. And honestly, whoever made that policy is not a woman. You cannot time it like that. A breastfeeding woman, when the milk wants to come out, it will come out. I cannot say, <laughs> I have to take this break 15 minutes. So things like that, you can see like, there are certain policies that are in place that you know technically. I don't think a woman was involved when they wrote this. They can't be like, oh, 15 minutes, a block of 15 minutes for me to pump. But it doesn't work like that. Nobody, whoever wrote that did not understand it. So those things. So now what's happening is that because that is the minimum, most companies comply to that. And most companies just tell the women, oh, but you have a 15 minute block. That's what the government said. So you should have a certain flexibility in terms of what the law says, what the policy says. You have that is not that is just a minimum suggestion, and you can go beyond that because honestly, it's it's a bit backwards there. Um, clear anti-harassment policies in place in the EU. Between forty to fifty percent of women reported they had experienced a form of sexual harassment in the workplace. This is sad because this is already in the EU. You could only imagine in certain countries where there's not a lot of protection for women, how high that numbers are. Um, so in your own organization, what protections do you have in place? Do you make sure that there are certain languages that you do not tolerate? There are certain jokes that you do not tolerate and there are certain behaviors that you, not, you do not tolerate. And as you start to grow, it's important to have a clear, transparent, and easy to understand anti-harassment and anti-sexual harassment policy. So again, it's not just some actions, but also look into the language. What languages do you not tolerate? Um, hate languages that you do not tolerate. Um, mechanisms for listening and responding to feedback internally. So it's not enough that you have policies in place, but there should be something institutional in place. You, do you provide surveys? Do you provide forms? Do you make sure like we, we have happiness survey to make sure that everyone is still okay, they feel safe, they feel heard. So things like that. 
Okay, um, sorry, Luca. This is a sample in languages. In Spanish, you can write the, the masculine or the feminine form. So this one, it's company not so long ago, six to a reusable food packing company. All job offers were written from a man's perspective and the founder decided to change that. So to have all jobs written universally to address all genders. So something to consider. Uh, my local language is Tagalog and we don't have genders. So to me, that is confusing to have genders. So there's no he or she in my language. So we're very much gender neutral. And in everything, there's no, I don't know, there's no aunt or auntie. It's just a, you know, there's siblings. No, we don't have a word for brother or sister, but siblings. So it's all neutral. So you have to acknowledge that there are certain languages that maybe it's better for you to use that. You should have to look into your language and the language that you use to make it more neutral. Uh, targeting women as a consumer group. So, so not just women, but minorities. So involving women or minorities in the development of your product. Product means that women are more likely to use that final product. So involvement can come like what I said, um, market research. And it's, it's, it's also important to test your product, not just in women, but also other minorities. And then for the intended users. Uh, this is important if you are targeting certain communities. Another thing that's important is that whenever you put out ads, whenever you put out communication, be mindful of what you put out. One example is that I've worked with a group of fisher folks in a bigger fishing company. And they were seeing that for a particular uh, area in the fishing community, for a particular fish, only women are fishing. And they would like to encourage that. They would like to say, you know, you we want you to feel safe when you're doing that by yourself, when you're on the boat and you're by yourself, we want you to feel safe. So they put out certain ads. So, so the heart is at the right place. But the posters that they put out were women who were really, how do you say, very visually appealing to the point that your focus is on how they look and not the fact that she felt safe fishing in that area. So be mindful of those things. It's not enough that you put a woman in the picture, but what are you highlighting? Is it the activity that she's doing, the fishing, or were you highlighting the way she looked? Because if you look at the ad, it looks like, an, I don't know, an advertisement for a skincare product or something like that. It's not her being, you know, not her feeling safe. So one of those those um one of those examples. Another one is that if you're working with communities and let's say these communities have less resources or are poor, a lot of people have the tendency to highlight that. But you always have to make sure that you handle those things with dignity. So those things, inclusivity, diversity, and equity is also about handling the experiences of these people with dignity. So fine, you want to show that these people have no access to water, but do not show them in a specific scene where they're, they're full of poverty and they're full of hurt and they're full of pain. There is a way of portraying certain loss of resources without making it look like people have no dignity. So that is, again, very important. When we are talking about equity and inclusion is also about handling the experiences of people with dignity and respect. So be mindful when you put out communications like that. I really, really don't like it when a lot of these countries are portrayed as like very poor. Like, okay, fine, they don't have access to water, but there are ways of showing that. You can say children on the well getting water, but they were happy and smiling. But you will say, oh, because of this lack of access to water, these are the things that they are experiencing instead of showing a sick child. So there are ways to handle it. Okay. Next. So an example is energy, sales energy in Cambodia realized that they were missing out on women as customer base, as men, and more likely to be making financial decisions in the household too. To even this imbalance out, they decided to offer incentives for women to take financial loan, often offering them a preferred interest rate. Okay, so this is about knowing your your knowing your um, target audience, knowing the people that you want to reach out to. 
But another thing that you also have to be mindful of is that um, when you talk about empowering women and when you talk about um, when you talk about empowering them and giving them more power economically, there are certain what do you say? There are certain cultural uh, meanings to it. So it has been shown time and time that the more that you involve women, whether you give them more power in terms of decision making, whether you involve them a lot more in startups, where you that whether you offer them a lot more loans, there is always, always an increase in gender based violence. Whenever women are empowered, whenever minorities are empowered, there is always that there's always instances of increased violence. So this is something that we need to take into consideration. That is why it's not only important for us to address like, okay, I put, we've reached out to a lot of startups. We have a lot of startup women, but not look into unpaid care work. So, you know, that's the, that's where the holistic approach that I mentioned comes into picture. If we just give them a means to increase their, their position in the economy without giving them the means to divest some of the responsibilities, then what you are what you are seeing are women who have double burden, double burden in terms of household, double burden in terms of raising children, and also now making money. So, like these are things that you look into. So, okay, fine. If you're a company or a startup that offers financial loan, maybe it's also important to have certain workshops with the men to explain why is there a need to look into unpaid care work? Why is there a need to have a more equal division of care? So, next. So create a persona. Who are the types of people that you want to use your product and services and how do they consume media? So think about it. Like think about your, your um, client as a person, what kind of a person this is. Map out that persona and Try to understand the likes and dislikes. Try to understand how does this, what does this person's day look like? How do they use my product? Um, how do they, how do they share this product to their friends? What, what is it that they are looking for? So, look into that persona of that person, and it helps if you have a diverse team because these people are looking into that persona through different lens into different perspectives. Uh, changing the type of people in your communications. That's what I mentioned. If you want to attract more women, you need to show more women in your communication. So representation is inspiration. But like I, what I mentioned, you have to be mindful. So you don't just put women in there. You just don't put minority in there. But what are you exactly highlighting? So what is it in their particular aspect of their individual that you want to highlight? So surely you just don't want to, don't want just pleasing in the eye. You know, but exactly what it is, what character is it that you want to highlight? Do not fall into the gender stereotype box. So you do not want to alienate potential customer base. So this is this is something that you should be mindful of. There are a lot of stereotypes. Um, I don't know if you watch The Office, but they have this particular um, particular episode where they were asked. They were put. They would put the race here, and then like. You know, that was their diversity exercise, saying things that reminds them of that race. So these are stereotypes. Be mindful of it. So what we want to highlight, actually, is the positive things in that certain culture. What is it about that culture that you can lift up, that, that, that provides certain positive, that provides a positive light to that culture? So change the type of places you are advertising. Like mentioned, go beyond the usual social media or traditional forms, radios, newspaper, in-person leaflets. So more women tend to be offline. So I've shared this to my team a couple of months back. It was very interesting. We were working with a startup in Tanzania and they were introducing a certain type of, of um, weeds that are also, that could function as a pesticide. And they were trying to reach out to rural areas. And they were telling me that the way to reach out to rural areas is not through radio or newspapers, but rather they hired a town crier. I don't know how to describe it, but someone who goes around the towns singing a song, singing a theme. So they had their own jingle, they produced a jingle, and that jingle was describing how to use that particular um, 
that particular weed as a pest control. So it was a jingle and that they paid that man to go around his communities to sing about it. And that's how they, they reached to their customers. And I found that amazing. It's amazing because if they just go to social media, if they text, you know, like a text brigade, then they only reach out to the people who probably already know the technology. You could probably Google that technology. So I found it amazing that they knew exactly how to reach out to their clients. And that's something to be, and that's something that you should think about in terms of your advertising or how to reach out to your clients. Maybe, I don't know, depends on your product. Maybe it's not through social media, newspaper. Maybe you should also hire a town crier to go around different towns and tell them about your product. So again, depends on what you're looking into. Okay, last one. So an example is Limo Plastic. It's a plastic recycling company that buys plastic from those selling at dump sites. So they quickly realized that nine out of 10 sellers on the dump sites were women. And in order to maximize women suppliers coming to them, they work on direct communications plans to address the needs of the women. So it's about talking to them. So like I said, so they quickly realized this is not through social media. This is not through texting. We need to gather them and talk to them and to figure out how could we properly um support them that's, that's that. so some discussions which intervention seems achievable for your organizations and what challenges or barriers would your business face to implement some of these ideas so just something to think about um next one i could already show this is just an example of a mainstreaming plan that you can use it's not just for gender but also for diversity equity and inclusion so you look at your leadership, your impact and goal. What do you want to achieve in terms of your leadership? What are the limitations of your organization? And first steps to taking action and what can you do right away? So essentially, it's sort of, this is a very simplified simplified plan. And I like I, like I was saying, like, I know that a lot of you are not starting out in different places. Like maybe some of you already have policies. Maybe some of you don't. Maybe some of you have everything in place already or most things in place already, so it's different. But this is just a suggestion on how you can work about it. So first you look at your leadership and what do you want to achieve? So the first column is what do you want to achieve? How do you envision an inclusive leadership? Again, this might be different. What an inclusive leadership is might be different for different organization, the meaning of that. So what is the limitation of your organization and the next column and the first step, the quick wins that you can do to achieve that. And again, you could, the next one is hiring and retaining a diverse team. How far are you from that? What kind of vision do you have for your team? The limitations and the quick wins that you can do first steps. And in terms of how do you develop your product, same thing, and how to improve your marketing and communications. So, um, and the next, in the version of the PowerPoint that we will send you, no, it's okay. Um, the first, I'll send the newer version because it's the older, sorry. Some of the things that, um, some of the things that, that could arise, some of the challenges that could arise when you're, when you're looking into um, the DEI is, is that you should have a public commitment. Like I was saying, um, Maybe you still don't have policies in place, but one of the quick wins that you could do is have a public commitment. So what does this mean? Maybe you have a website. You could have a clear commitment to DEI, dedicate a section on your website and say, we want to look into diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay, because that is the first public acknowledgement and whatever whatever policies, and you can develop that on the next steps. But ha make it public, because then that would push you to do better. So that could be your first step. Again, maybe as simple as a certain part of your website, you include it, a certain part of your statement, you include it. That could be the first step, but it doesn't mean that you stop there. And then that's through that, that will push you to develop your policies in place, your protections in place. Next is you could look into your policies and benefits. You could review that. So I'm I'm just I'm just giving samples of quick wins that you can do. You 
look at your policies, update that, um, look into the leadership, the leaders that, that you have, um, how diverse are they? Uh, next is that you need to have clear goals and metrics in terms of what you want to achieve. So you just don't say, we want to hire X number of people, we want to reach X number of people, but have a clear goal. So one of the things that could help you have a clear goal is to know where you are as an organization in terms of DEI. So how do you know that? How do you know where you are, where you stand? Um, do you know exactly the knowledge and the understanding of the people you're working with? Do they believe that there should be diversity, equity, and inclusion? Or are you working with people who are racist that you still don't know? So <laughs> you don't know. So what are these things? You know, you don't know that. So there are things to know what your baseline is. Because you, you, like I said, you're in different paths now. So maybe some of you still don't know where you are, where organization stands. So one of those things that you could do is just to have a quick survey, um, check what training needs, what are the training needs of your organization, just a quick survey on the training needs, a quick survey on people's understanding on what DEI is. It doesn't have to be long. It can be very quick. Um, just a simple survey monkey or a Google form just to see what they understand. Some simple sentences that they agree with. Let's just say you're working on climate change and you say, um, climate change is a political question or like uh, climate change has a, has a direct link to refugees and migration, things like that, agree or disagree. And through that, you will see, you can base the understanding of your organization. You can see pretty much what they know and what they understand. This is very important because you could have policies in place, but if your people do not believe in the core values of it, then it's pretty much useless. So that's one of those quick wins that you can have. Just figure out where you are. What do the people believe in? That could, again, be just a quick survey. And through that, you would know what kind of, of, of training uh, you want your organization to have. I know that maybe you are overwhelmed right now because maybe you're thinking, oh, there's so much to do, so much to change within the organization. Don't. So there are quick wins. There's small things that you can do. It doesn't happen overnight. And to be honest with you, Climate Kick is not even there yet. So it's a journey. So <laughs> it's a journey to get there. So you have to look at it first, make it public, have a public declaration. Okay, we want to look into DEI. Second is that figure out where you are right now. Again, that's through quick surveys or whatever. And through that surveys, think about what you need to change right away. If you see that, oh my God, in my organizations, a lot of them do not have the same understanding. So you don't go right away to policies because there's no point in making policies if the people you're working with do not believe in it anyway. So you see, the, and therefore you would see the first step, which is probably having trainings or having workshops on biases, um, just talking about different biases, talking about differences, or you realize that you have some staff who are homophobic. So you can have workshop on so sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, to be honest, I've worked with organizations like that. They were, uh, I worked before with Southeast Asia and they were a huge, huge company, fishing company, and they realized that a lot of their leadership staff, not the not the main leaders, but you know, the middle management, a lot of them were very homophobic. So they were like, oh, the first thing to do is not actually to do policies, but to educate these people. So from there, then you would know your which of your first steps are. Okay. And after that, you can have training. And if you see that, oh, we're okay, we're at the same understanding, we're at the same level of understanding, same knowledge then you can do training needs because you're maybe you are more sophisticated. You can do training needs. Okay, after that training need, and then you can say, oh, these are the needs to, that needs to be addressed, and then we can go to policies in place. What are the policies that need to be in place? Again, you do not have to reinvent the wheel. You can check the policies in place of other companies and base yours with that one. Um, it's overwhelming if you have to do everything from scratch, but there are other companies who have done this. If you look at OECD, if you look at UN Women, if you look at ILO websites, there are templates to that. There are, 
like in and I know with you and women they have the Pisea, um Pisea, Pisea's protection on sexual uh I forgot it. But anyway, it's like a protection mechanism that you can set in place for your company for anti-harassment. So they have an entire handbook on that one that you can just use that to form your own um anti-harassment policies or protection mechanisms in place. So you again you do not have to reinvent the wheel. Another thing is another quick win is to foster inclusive culture. How do you do this? Small things like you would have informal meetings that's like culture building, just saying hi, hello, asking them about their childhood, asking them about their favorite recipes, favorite food, things like that. So it's just a it's sort of like a culture building and getting to know each other, not just in the context of, of the organization or the startup, but getting to know more about their culture. Like my favorite thing is asking about their favorite recipes and comfort food, because that says a lot. And, you know, their background, it not only highlights what kind of background they have, but also their culture. And also it's so fun to replicate it yourself. So things like that, culture building. There are other things. Another is maybe, I you know, I don't know if you are if you work remotely or not, or it's sort of a hybrid, but you could have some sort of um different employee groups. Um, let's say they have different interests. They can meet for tennis, they can meet for volleyball, those things. Because these highlights how people get to know each other and how when they get to know in, uh, each other in the context of their interests, then they'd be more open to, they'd, they'd be more open in interacting to each other. Um, so just, those are just some of the quick wins that you could do within your organization. Um, that's it. Do we have any thoughts, questions? 